Chapter 15 of Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Up from Slavery, Chapter 15 The Secret of Success in Public Speaking. As to how my address at Atlanta was received by the audience in the exposition building, I think I prefer to let Mr. James Creelman, the noted war correspondent, tell. Mr. Creelman was present and telegraphed the following account to the New York World. Atlanta, September 18. While President Cleveland was waiting at Gray Gables today to send the electric spark that started the machinery of the Atlanta exposition, a Negro Moses stood before a great audience of white people and delivered an oration that marks a new epoch in the history of the South. And a body of Negro troops marched in a procession with the citizen soldiery of Georgia and Louisiana. The whole city is thrilling tonight with a realization of the extraordinary significance of these two unprecedented events. Nothing has happened since Henry Grady's immortal speech before the New England Society in New York that indicates so profoundly the spirit of the New South, except, perhaps, the opening of the exposition itself. When Professor Booker T. Washington, principal of an industrial school for colored people in Tuskegee, Alabama, stood on the platform of the auditorium, with the sun shining over the heads of his auditors into his eyes, and with his whole face lit up with the fire of prophecy, Clark Howell, the successor of Henry Grady, said to me, That man's speech is the beginning of a moral revolution in America. It is the first time that a Negro has made a speech in the South on any important occasion before an audience composed of white men and women. It electrified the audience, and the response was as if it had come from the throat of a whirlwind. Mrs. Thompson had hardly taken her seat when all eyes were turned on a tall, tawny negro sitting in the front row of the platform. It was Professor Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee, Alabama Normal and Industrial Institute, who must rank from this time forth as the foremost man of his race in America. Gilmore's band played the Star-Spangled Banner, and the audience cheered. The tune changed to Dixie, and the audience roared with shrill, high eyes. Again the music changed, this time to Yankee Doodle, and the clamor lessened. All this time the eyes of the thousands present looked straight at the negro orator. A strange thing was to happen. A black man was to speak for his people, with none to interrupt him. As Professor Washington strode to the edge of the stage, the low, descending sun shot fiery rays through the windows into his face. A great shout greeted him. He turned his head to avoid the blinding light and moved about the platform for relief. Then he turned his wonderful countenance to the sun without a blink of the eyelids and began to talk. There was a remarkable figure, tall, bony, straight as a Sioux chief, high forehead, straight nose, heavy jaws, and strong, determined mouth with big white teeth, piercing eyes, and a commanding manner. The sinew stood out on his bronze neck, and his muscular right arm swung high in the air, with a lead pencil grasped in the clinched brown fist. His big feet were planted squarely, with the heels together and the toes turned out. His voice rang out clear and true, and he paused impressively as he made each point. Within ten minutes the multitude was in an uproar of enthusiasm. Handkerchiefs were waved, canes were flourished, hats were tossed in the air. The fairest women of Georgia stood up and cheered. It was as if the orator had bewitched them. And when he held his dusky hand high above his head, with the fingers stretched wide apart, and said to the white people of the South on behalf of his race, In all things that are purely social we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. The great wave of sound dashed itself against the walls, and the whole audience was on its feet in a delirium of applause and I thought at that moment of the night when Henry Grady stood among the curling wreaths of tobacco smoke in Delmonico's banquet hall and said, I am a cavalier among roundheads. I have heard the great orators of many countries, but not even Gladstone himself could have pleased a cause with most consummate power than did this angular negro, standing in a nimbus of sunshine, surrounded by the men who once fought to keep his race in bondage. The roar might swell ever so high, but the expression of his earnest face never changed. 
a ragged, bony giant, squatted on the floor in one of the aisles, watched the orator with burning eyes and tremulous face until the supreme burst of applause came, and then the tears ran down his face. Most of the negroes in the audience were crying, perhaps without knowing just why. At the close of the speech, Governor Bullock rushed across the stage and seized the orator's hand. Another shout greeted this demonstration, and for a few minutes the two men stood facing each other, hand in hand. So far as I could spare the time from the immediate work at Tuskegee after my Atlanta address, I accepted some of the invitations to speak in public which came to me, especially those that would take me into territory where I thought it would pay to plead the cause of my race, but I always did this with the understanding that I was to be free to talk about my life-work and the needs of my people. I also had it understood that I was not to speak in the capacity of a professional lecturer or for mere commercial gain. In my efforts on the public platform I never have been able to understand why people come to hear me speak. This question I never can rid myself of. Time and time again, as I have stood in the street in front of a building and have seen men and women passing in large numbers into the audience room where I was to speak, I have felt ashamed that I should be the cause of people, as it seemed to me, wasting a valuable hour of their time. Some years ago I was to deliver an address before a literary society in Madison, Wisconsin. An hour before the time set for me to speak, a fierce snowstorm began, and continued for several hours. I made up my mind that there would be no audience, and that I should not have to speak, but as a matter of duty I went to the church and found it packed with people. The surprise gave me a shock that I did not recover from during the whole evening. People often ask me if I feel nervous before speaking, or else they suggest that, since I speak often, they suppose that I get used to it. In answer to this question I have to say that I always suffer intensely from nervousness before speaking. More than once, just before I was to make an important address, this nervous strain has been so great that I have resolved never again to speak in public. I not only feel nervous before speaking, but after I have finished I usually feel a sense of regret, because it seems to me if I had left out of my address the main thing and the best thing that I had meant to say. There is a great compensation, though, for this preliminary nervous suffering that comes to me after I have been speaking for about ten minutes, and have come to feel that I have really mastered my audience, and that we have gotten into full and complete sympathy with each other. It seems to me that there is rarely such a combination of mental and physical delight in any effort as that which comes to a public speaker when he feels that he has a great audience completely within his control. There is a thread of sympathy and oneness that connects a public speaker with his audience that is just as strong as though it was something tangible and visible. If in an audience of a thousand people there is one person who is not in sympathy with my views, or is inclined to be doubtful, cold or critical, I can pick him out. When I have found him I usually go straight at him, and it is a great satisfaction to watch the process of his thawing out. I find that the most effective medicine for such individuals is administered at first in the form of a story, although I never tell an anecdote simply for the sake of telling one. That kind of thing, I think, is empty and hollow, and an audience soon finds it out. I believe that one always does himself and his audience an injustice when he speaks merely for the sake of speaking. I do not believe that one should speak unless, deep down in his heart, he feels convinced that he has a message to deliver. When one feels, from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head, that he has something to say that is going to help some individual or some cause, then let him say it. And in delivering his message, I do not believe that many of the artificial rules of elocution can, under such circumstances, help him very much. Although there are certain things, such as pauses, breathing, and pitch of voice, that are very important. None of these can take the place of soul in an address. When I have an address to deliver, I like to forget all about the rules for proper use of the English language, and all about rhetoric and that sort of thing, and I like to make the audience forget all about these things too. Nothing tends to throw me off my balance so quickly when I am speaking as to have someone leave the room. To prevent this I make up my mind as a rule 
that I will try to make my address so interesting, will try to state so many interesting facts one after another, that no one can leave. The average audience, I have come to believe, wants facts rather than generalities or sermonizing. Most people, I think, are able to draw proper conclusions if they are given the facts in an interesting form on which to base them. As to the kind of audience that I'd like best to talk to, I would put at the top of the list an organization of strong, wide-awake, businessmen, such, for example, as is found in Boston, New York, Chicago, and Buffalo. I have found no other audience so quick to see a point, and so responsive. Within the last few years, I have had the privilege of speaking before most of the leading organizations of this kind in the large cities of the United States. The best time to get hold of an organization of businessmen is after a good dinner, although I think that one of the worst instruments of torture that was ever invented is the custom which makes it necessary for a speaker to sit through a fourteen-course dinner, every minute of the time feeling sure that his speech is going to prove a dismal failure and disappointment. I rarely take part in one of these long dinners that I do not wish that I could put myself back in the little cabin where I was a slave boy, and again go through the experience there, one that I shall never forget, of getting molasses to eat once a week from the big house. Our usual diet on the plantation was cornbread and pork, but on Sunday morning my mother was permitted to bring down a little molasses from the big house for her three children, and when it was received how I did wish that every day was Sunday. I would get my tin plate and hold it up for the sweet morsel, but I would always shut my eyes while the molasses was being poured out into the plate, with the hope that when I opened them I would be surprised to see how much I had got. When I opened my eyes I would tip the plate in one direction and another, so as to make the molasses spread all over it, in the full belief that there would be more of it and that it would last longer if spread out in this way. So strong are my childish impressions of those Sunday morning feasts, that it would be pretty hard for anyone to convince me that there is not more molasses on a plate when it is spread all over the plate than when it occupies a little corner, if there is a corner in a plate. At any rate, I have never believed in cornering syrup. My share of the syrup was usually about two tablespoonfuls, and those two spoonfuls of molasses were much more enjoyable to me than is a fourteen-course dinner after which I am to speak. Next to a company of businessmen, I prefer to speak to an audience of southern people of either race, together or taken separately. Their enthusiasm and responsiveness are a constant delight. The amens and that's the truth that come spontaneously from the colored individuals are calculated to spur any speaker on to his best efforts. I think that next in order of preference I would place a college audience. It has been my privilege to deliver addresses at many of our leading colleges, including Harvard, Yale, Williams, Amherst, Fisk University, the University of Pennsylvania, Wellesley, the University of Michigan, Trinity College in North Carolina, and many others. It has been a matter of deep interest to me to note the number of people who have come to shake hands with me after an address who say that this is the first time that they have ever called a negro mister. When speaking directly in the interests of the Tuskegee Institute, I usually arrange, some time in advance, a series of meetings in important centers. This takes me before churches, Sunday schools, Christian Endeavor societies, and men's and women's clubs. When doing this, I sometimes speak before as many as four organizations in a single day. Three years ago, at the suggestion of Mr. Morris K. Jessup of New York and Dr. J. L. M. Curry, the general agent of the fund, the trustees of the John F. Slater Fund voted a sum of money to be used in paying the expenses of Mrs. Washington and myself while holding a series of meetings among the colored people in the large centers of Negro population, especially in the large cities of the ex-slaveholding states. Each year during the last three years we have devoted some weeks to this work. The plan that we have followed has been for me to speak in the morning to the ministers, teachers, and professional men. In the afternoon, Mrs. Washington would speak to the women alone, and in the evening I spoke to a large mass meeting. In almost every case the meetings have been attended not only by the colored people in large numbers, but by the white people. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, for example, 
there was present at the mass meeting an audience of not less than three thousand persons, and I was informed that eight hundred of these were white. I have done no work that I really enjoyed more than this, or that I think has accomplished more good. These meetings have given Mrs. Washington and myself an opportunity to get first-hand, accurate information as to the real condition of the race, by seeing the people in their homes, their churches, their Sunday schools, and their places of work, as well as in the prisons and dens of crime. These meetings also gave us an opportunity to see the relations that exist between the races. I never feel so hopeful about the race as I do after being engaged in a series of these meetings. I know that on such occasions there is much that comes to the surface that is superficial and deceptive, but I have had experience enough not to be deceived by mere signs and fleeting enthusiasms. I have taken pains to go to the bottom of things and get facts, in a cold, business-like manner. I have seen the statement made lately, by one who claims to know what he is talking about, that, taking the whole negro race into account, ninety per cent of the negro women are not virtuous. There never was a baser falsehood uttered concerning a race, or a statement made that was less capable of being proved by actual facts. No one came into contact with the race for twenty years, as I have done in the heart of the South, without being convinced that the race is constantly making slow but sure progress materially, educationally, and morally. One might take up the life of the worst element in New York City, for example, and prove almost anything he wanted to prove concerning the white man, but all will agree that this is not a fair test. Early in the year 1897 I received a letter inviting me to deliver an address at the dedication of the Robert Gould Shaw Monument in Boston. I accepted the invitation. It is not necessary for me, I am sure, to explain who Robert Gould Shaw was and what he did. The monument to his memory stands near the head of the Boston Common, facing the State House. It is counted to be the most perfect piece of art of the kind to be found in the country. The exercises connected with the dedication were held in Music Hall in Boston, and the great hall was packed from top to bottom with one of the most distinguished audiences that ever assembled in the city. Among those present were more persons representing the famous old anti-slavery element that is likely will ever be brought together in the country again. The late Hon. Roger Wolcott, then Governor of Massachusetts, was the presiding officer, and on the platform with him were many other officials and hundreds of distinguished men. A report of the meeting which appeared in the Boston Transcript will describe it better than any words of mine could do. The corps and colonel of yesterday's great noon meeting in honor of the Brotherhood of Man in Music Hall was the superb address of the Negro President of Tuskegee. Booker T. Washington received his Harvard A.M. last June, the first of his race," said Governor Walcott. To receive an honorary degree from the oldest university in the land, and this for the wise leadership of his people. When Mr. Washington rose in the flag-filled, enthusiasm-warmed, patriotic and glowing atmosphere of Music Hall, people felt keenly that here was the civic justification of the old abolition spirit of Massachusetts. In his person the proof of her ancient and indomitable faith, in his strong thought and rich oratory, the crown and glory of the old war days of suffering and strife. The scene was full of historic beauty and deep significance. Cold Boston was alive with the fire that is always hot in her heart for righteousness and truth. Rows and rows of people who are seldom seen at any public function, whole families of those who are certain to be out of town on a holiday, crowded the place to overflowing. The city was at her birthright in the persons of hundreds of her best citizens, men and women whose names and lives stand for the virtues that make for honorable civic pride. Battle music had filled the air. Ovation after ovation, applause, warm and prolonged, had greeted the officers and friends of Colonel Shaw, the sculptor, St. Gaudens, the memorial committee, the governor and his staff, and the negro soldiers of the 54th Massachusetts as they came upon the platform or entered the hall. Colonel Henry Lee of Governor Andrews' old staff had made a noble, simple presentation speech for the committee, paying tribute to Mr. John M. Forbes, in whose stead he served. Governor Wolcott had made his short, memorable speech, saying, 
Fort Wagner marked an epoch in the history of a race, and called it into manhood. Mayor Quincy had received the monument for the city of Boston. The story of Colonel Shaw and his black regiment had been told in gallant words, and then, after the singing of, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, Booker Washington arose. It was, of course, just the moment for him. The multitude, shaken out of its usual symphony concert calm, quivered with an excitement that was not suppressed. A dozen times it had sprung to its feet to cheer and wave and hurrah as one person. When this man of culture and voice and power, as well as a dark skin, began and uttered the names of Stearns and of Andrew, feeling began to mount. You could see tears glisten in the eyes of soldiers and civilians. When the orator turned to the colored soldiers on the platform, to the color-bearer of Fort Wagner, who smilingly bore still the flag he had never lowered even when wounded, and said, To you, to the scarred and scattered remnants of the fifty-fourth, who, with empty sleeve and wanting leg, have honored this occasion with your presence, to you, your commander is not dead. Though Boston erected no monument and history recorded no story, in you and in the loyal race which you represent, Robert Gould Shaw would have a monument which time could not wear away. Then came the climax of the emotion of the day and the hour. It was Roger Wolcott, as well as Governor of Massachusetts, the individual representative of the people's sympathy as well as the chief magistrate, who had sprung first to his feet and cried, Three cheers to Booker T. Washington! Among those on the platform was Sergeant William H. Kearney of New Bedford, Massachusetts, the brave colored officer who was the color-bearer at Fort Wagner and held the American flag. In spite of the fact that a large part of his regiment was killed, he escaped, and exclaimed, after the battle was over, The old flag never touched the ground. This flag Sergeant Kearney held in his hands, as he sat on the platform, and when I turned to address the survivors of the colored regiment who were present, and referred to Sergeant Kearney, he rose as if by instinct and raised the flag. It has been my privilege to witness a good many satisfactory and rather sensational demonstrations in connection with some of my public addresses, but in dramatic effect I have never seen or experienced anything which equaled this. For a number of minutes the audience seemed to entirely lose control of itself. In the general rejoicing throughout the country which followed the close of the Spanish-American War, peace celebrations were arranged in several of the large cities. I was asked by President William R. Harper of the University of Chicago, who was chairman of the Committee of Invitations for the celebration to be held in the city of Chicago, to deliver one of the addresses at the celebration there. I accepted the invitation and delivered two addresses there during the Jubilee week. The first of these, and the principal one, was given in the auditorium on the evening of Sunday, October 16. This was the largest audience that I have ever addressed, in any part of the country. And besides speaking in the main auditorium, I also addressed, that same evening, two overflow audiences in other parts of the city. It was said that there were sixteen thousand persons in the auditorium, and it seemed to me as if there were as many more on the outside trying to get in. It was impossible for anyone to get near the entrance without the aid of a policeman. President William McKinley attended this meeting, as did also the members of his cabinet, many foreign ministers, and a large number of army and navy officers, many of whom had distinguished themselves in the war which had just closed. The speakers, besides myself, on Sunday evening were Rabbi Emil G. Hirsch, Father Thomas P. Hodnett, and Dr. John H. Barrows. The Chicago Times-Herald, in describing the meeting, said of my address, He pictured the Negro choosing slavery rather than extinction. Recalled Crispus Attucks shedding his blood at the beginning of the American Revolution that white Americans might be free while black Americans remained in slavery. Rehearsed the conduct of the Negroes with Jackson at New Orleans drew a vivid and pathetic picture of the southern slaves protecting and supporting the families of their masters while the latter were fighting to perpetuate black slavery, recounted the bravery of colored troops at Port Hudson and Forts Wagner and Pillow, and praised the heroism of the black regiments that stormed El Caney and Santiago to give freedom to the enslaved people of Cuba, 
forgetting for the time being the unjust discrimination that law and custom make against them in their own country. In all of these things the speaker declared his race had chosen the better part, and then he made his eloquent appeal to the consciences of the white Americans. When you have gotten the full story of the heroic conduct of the Negro in the Spanish-American War, have heard it from the lips of northern soldier and southern soldier, from ex-abolitionists and ex-masters, then decide within yourselves whether a race that is thus willing to die for its country should not be given the highest opportunity to live for its country." The part of the speech which seems to arouse the wildest and most sensational enthusiasm was that in which I thanked the President for his recognition of the Negro in his appointments during the Spanish-American War. The President was sitting in a box at the right of the stage. When I addressed him I turned toward the box, and as I finished the sentence thanking him for his generosity, the whole audience rose and cheered again and again, waving handkerchiefs and hats and canes, until the President arose in the box and bowed his acknowledgments. At that the enthusiasm broke out again, and the demonstration was almost indescribable. One portion of my address at Chicago seemed to have been misunderstood by the Southern press and some of the Southern papers took occasion to criticize me rather strongly. These criticisms continued for several weeks, until I finally received a letter from the editor of the Age Herald, published in Birmingham, Alabama, asking me if I would say just what I meant by this part of the address. I replied to him in a letter which seemed to satisfy my critics. In this letter I said that I had made it a rule never to say before a Northern audience anything that I would not say before an audience in the South. I said that I did not think it was necessary for me to go into extended explanations. If my seventeen years of work in the heart of the South had not been explanation enough, I did not see how words could explain. I said that I made the same plea that I had made in my address at Atlanta, for the blotting out of race prejudice in commercial and civil relations. I said that what is termed social recognition was a question which I never discussed, and then I quoted from my Atlanta address what I had said there in regard to that subject. In meeting crowds of people at public gatherings there is one type of individual that I dread. I mean the crank. I have become so accustomed to these people now that I can pick them out at a distance when I see them elbowing their way up to me. The average crank has a long beard poorly cared for, a lean, narrow face, and wears a black coat. The front of his vest and coat are slick with grease and his trousers bag at the knees. In Chicago, after I had spoken at a meeting, I met one of these fellows. They usually have some process for curing all of the ills of the world at once. This Chicago specimen had a patent process by which he said Indian corn could be kept through a period of three or four years and he felt sure that if the negro race in the South would, as a whole, adopt his process, it would settle the whole race question. It mattered nothing that I tried to convince him that our present problem was to teach the negroes how to produce enough corn to last them through one year. Another Chicago crank had a scheme by which he wanted me to join him in an effort to close up all the national banks in the country. If that was done he felt sure it would put the negro on his feet. The number of people who stand ready to consume one's time, to no purpose, is almost countless. At one time I spoke before a large audience in Boston in the evening. The next morning I was awakened by having a card brought to my room, and with it a message that said someone was anxious to see me. Thinking that it must be something very important, I dressed hastily and went down. When I reached the hotel office I found a blank and innocent-looking individual waiting for me, who coolly remarked, I heard you talk at a meeting last night. I rather liked your talk, and so I came in this morning to hear you talk some more. I am often asked how it is possible for me to superintend the work at Tuskegee and at the same time be so much away from the school. In partial answer to this, I would say that I think I have learned, in some degree at least, to disregard the old maxim which says, Do not get others to do that which you can do yourself. My motto, on the other hand, is, do not do that which others can do as well. One of the most encouraging signs in connection with the Tuskegee School 
is found in the fact that the organization is so thorough that the daily work of the school is not dependent upon the presence of any one individual. The whole executive force, including instructors and clerks, now numbers eighty-six. This force is so organized and subdivided that the machinery of the school goes on day by day like clockwork. Most of our teachers have been connected with the institutions for a number of years, and are as much interested in it as I am. In my absence, Mr. Warren Logan, the treasurer, who has been at the school seventeen years, is the executive. He is efficiently supported by Mrs. Washington and by my faithful secretary, Mr. Emmett J. Scott, who handles the bulk of my correspondence and keeps me in daily touch with the life of the school, and who also keeps me informed of whatever takes place in the South that concerns the race. I owe more to his tact, wisdom, and hard work than I can describe. The main executive work of the school, whether I am at Tuskegee or not, centers in what we call the Executive Council. This council meets twice a week, and is composed of the nine persons who are at the head of the nine departments of the school. For example, Mrs. B. K. Bruce, the lady principal, the widow of the late ex-Senator Bruce, is a member of the council, and represents in it all that pertains to the life of the girls at the school. In addition to the Executive Council there is a financial committee of six, that meets every week and decides upon the expenditures for the week. Once a month, and sometimes oftener, there is a general meeting of all the instructors. Aside from these, there are innumerable smaller meetings, such as that of the instructors in the Phelps Hall Bible Training School, or of the instructors in the Agricultural Department. In order that I may keep in constant touch with the life of the institution, I have a system of reports so arranged that a record of the school's work reaches me every day of the year, no matter in what part of the country I am. I know by these reports even what students are excused from school and why they are excused, whether for reasons of ill health or otherwise. Through the medium of these reports I know each day what the income of the school in money is, I know how many gallons of milk and how many pounds of butter come from the dairy, what the bill of fare for the teachers and students is, whether a certain kind of meat is boiled or baked, and whether certain vegetables served in the dining-room were bought from a store or procured from our own farm. Human nature I find to be very much the same the world over, and it is sometimes not hard to yield to the temptation to go to a barrel of rice that has come from the store, with the grain all prepared to go in the pot, rather than to take the time and trouble to go to the field and dig and wash one's own sweet potatoes, which might be prepared in a manner to take the place of the rice. I am often asked how, in the midst of so much work, a large part of which is for the public, I can find time for any rest or recreation, and what kind of recreation or sports I am fond of. This is rather a difficult question to answer. I have a strong feeling that every individual owes it to himself, and to the cause which he is serving, to keep a vigorous, healthy body, with the nerves steady and strong, prepared for great efforts, and prepared for disappointments and trying positions. As far as I can, I make it a rule to plan for each day's work, not merely to go through with the same routine of daily duties, but to get rid of the routine work as early in the day as possible, and then to enter upon some new or advanced work. I make it a rule to clear my desk every day before leaving my office, of all correspondence and memoranda, so that on the morrow I can begin a new day of work. I make it a rule never to let my work drive me but to so master it and keep it in such complete control and to keep so far ahead of it that I will be the master instead of the servant. There is a physical and mental and spiritual enjoyment that comes from a consciousness of being the absolute master of one's work in all its details that is very satisfactory and inspiring. My experience teaches me that, if one learns to follow this plan, he gets a freshness of body and vigor of mind out of work that goes a long way toward keeping him strong and healthy. I believe that when one can grow to the point where he loves his work, this gives him a kind of strength that is most valuable. When I begin my work in the morning, I expect to have a successful and pleasant day of it, but at the same time I prepare myself for unpleasant and unexpected hard places. I prepare myself to hear that one of our school buildings is on fire, or has burned, or that some disagreeable accident has occurred. 
or that someone has abused me in a public address or printed article, for something that I have done or omitted to do, or for something that he had heard that I had said, probably something that I had never thought of saying. In nineteen years of continuous work I have taken but one vacation. That was two years ago, when some of my friends put the money into my hands and forced Mrs. Washington and myself to spend three months in Europe. I have said that I believe it is the duty of everyone to keep his body in good condition. I try to look after the little ills, with the idea that if I take care of the little ills the big ones will not come. When I find myself unable to sleep well I know that something is wrong. If I find any part of my system the least weak and not performing its duty I consult a good physician. The ability to sleep well, at any time and in any place, I find of great advantage. I have so trained myself that I can lie down for a nap of fifteen or twenty minutes and get up refreshed in body and mind. I have said that I make it a rule to finish up each day's work before leaving it. There is, perhaps, one exception to this. When I have an unusually difficult question to decide, one that appeals strongly to the emotions, I find it a safe rule to sleep over it for a night, or to wait until I have had an opportunity to talk it over with my wife and friends. As to my reading, the most time I get for solid reading is when I am on the cars. Newspapers are to me a constant source of delight and recreation. The only trouble is that I read too many of them. Fiction I care little for. Frequently I have to almost force myself to read a novel that is on everyone's lips. The kind of reading that I have the greatest fondness for is biography. I like to be sure that I am reading about a real man or a real thing. I think I do not go too far when I say that I have read nearly every book and magazine article that has been written about Abraham Lincoln. In literature he is my patron saint. Out of the twelve months in a year I suppose that, on an average, I spend six months away from Tuskegee. While my being absent from the school so much unquestionably has its disadvantages, yet there are at the same time some compensations. The change of work brings a certain kind of rest. I enjoy a ride of a long distance on the cars, when I am permitted to ride where I can be comfortable. I get rest on the cars, except when the inevitable individual who seems to be on every train approaches me with the now familiar phrase, Isn't this Booker Washington? I want to introduce myself to you." Absence from the school enables me to lose sight of the unimportant details of the work, and study it in a broader and more comprehensive manner than I could do on the grounds. This absence also brings me into contact with the best work being done in educational lines, and into contact with the best educators in the land. But after all this is said, the time when I get the most solid rest and recreation is when I can be at Tuskegee, and, after our evening meal is over, can sit down, as is our custom, with my wife and Portia and Baker and Davidson, my three children, and read a story, or each take turns in telling a story. To me there is nothing on earth equal to that, although what is nearly equal to it is to go with them for an hour or more, as we like to do on Sunday afternoons into the woods where we can live for a while near the heart of nature, where no one can disturb or vex us, surrounded by pure air, the trees, the shrubbery, the flowers, and the sweet fragrance that springs from a hundred plants, enjoying the chirp of the crickets and the songs of the birds. This is solid rest. My garden also, what little time I can be at Tuskegee, is another source of rest and enjoyment. Somehow I like, as often as possible, to touch nature, not something that is artificial or an imitation, but the real thing. When I can leave my office in time so that I can spend thirty or forty minutes in spading the ground, in planting seeds, in digging about the plants, I feel that I am coming into contact with something that is giving me strength for the many duties and hard places that await me out in the big world. I pity the man or woman who has never learned to enjoy nature and to get strength and inspiration out of it. Aside from the large number of fowls and animals kept by the school, I keep individually a number of pigs and fowls of the best grades, and in raising these I take a great deal of pleasure. 
I think the pig is my favorite animal. Few things are more satisfactory to me than a high-grade Berkshire or Poland China pig. Games I care little for. I have never seen a game of football. In cards I do not know one card from another. A game of old-fashioned marbles with my two boys once in a while is all I care for in this direction. I suppose I could care for games now if I had had any time in my youth to give to them, but that was not possible. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Up From Slavery. Chapter 16. Europe. In 1893 I was married to Miss Margaret James Murray, a native of Mississippi and a graduate of Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, who had come to Tuskegee as a teacher several years before and at the time we were married was filling the position of lady principal. Not only is Mrs. Washington completely one with me in the work directly connected with the school, relieving me of many burdens and perplexities, but aside from her work on the school grounds she carries on a mother's meeting in the town of Tuskegee, and a plantation work among the women, children, and men who live in a settlement connected with a large plantation about eight miles from Tuskegee. Both the mother's meeting and the plantation work are carried on, not only with a view to helping those who are directly reached, but also for the purpose of furnishing object lessons in these two kinds of work that may be followed by our students when they go out into the world for their own life work. Aside from these two enterprises, Mrs. Washington is also largely responsible for a woman's club at the school, which brings together, twice a month, the women who live on the school grounds and those who live near for the discussion of some important topic. She is also the president of what is known as the Federation of Southern Colored Women's Clubs, and is chairman of the executive committee of the National Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Portia, the oldest of my three children, has learned dressmaking. She has unusual ability in instrumental music. Aside from her studies at Tuskegee, she has already begun to teach there. Booker Taliaferro is my next oldest child. Young as he is, he has already nearly mastered the brickmason's trade. He began working at this trade when he was quite small, dividing his time between this and classwork, and he has developed great skill in the trade and a fondness for it. He says that he is going to be an architect and brickmason. One of the most satisfactory letters that I have ever received from anyone came to me from Booker last summer. When I left home for the summer, I told him that he must work at his trade half of each day, and that the other half of the day he could spend as he pleased. When I had been away from home two weeks, I received the following letter from him. Tuskegee, Alabama. My dear Papa, before you left home you told me to work at my trade half of each day. I like my work so much that I want to work at my trade all day. Besides, I want to earn all the money I can so that when I go to another school I shall have money to pay my expenses. Your son, Booker. My youngest child, Ernest Davidson Washington, says that he is going to be a physician. In addition to going to school, where he studies books and has manual training, he regularly spends a portion of his time in the office of our resident physician, and has already learned to do many of the duties which pertain to a doctor's office. The thing in my life which brings me the keenest regret is that my work in connection with public affairs keeps me for so much of the time away from my family, where of all places in the world I delight to be. I always envy the individual whose life work is so laid that he can spend his evenings at home. I have sometimes thought that people who have this rare privilege do not appreciate it as they should. It is such a rest and relief to get away from crowds of people and handshaking and traveling to get home, even if it be for but a very brief while. Another thing at Tuskegee, out of which I get a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction, is in the meeting with our students and teachers and their families in the chapel for devotional exercises every evening at half-past eight, the last thing before retiring for the night. 
It is an inspiring sight when one stands on the platform there and sees before him eleven or twelve hundred earnest young men and women, and one cannot but feel that it is a privilege to help to guide them to a higher and more useful life. In the spring of 1899 there came to me what I might describe as almost the greatest surprise of my life. Some good ladies in Boston arranged a public meeting in the interests of Tuskegee, to be held in the Hollis Street Theatre. This meeting was attended by large numbers of the best people of Boston of both races. Bishop Lawrence presided. In addition to an address made by myself, Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar read from his poems, and Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois read an original sketch. Some of those who attended this meeting noticed that I seemed unusually tired, and some little time after the close of the meeting one of the ladies who had been interested in it asked me in a casual way if I had ever been to Europe. I replied that I never had. She asked me if I had ever thought of going, and I told her no, that it was something entirely beyond me. This conversation soon passed out of my mind, but a few days afterward I was informed that some friends in Boston, including Mr. Francis J. Garrison, had raised a sum of money sufficient to pay all the expenses of Mrs. Washington and myself during a three or four months' trip to Europe. It was added with emphasis that we must go. A year previous to this Mr. Garrison had attempted to get me to promise to go to Europe for a summer's rest, with the understanding that he would be responsible for raising the money among his friends for the expenses of the trip. At that time such a journey seemed so entirely foreign to anything that I should ever be able to undertake that I did confess I did not give the matter very serious attention. But later Mr. Garrison joined his efforts to those of the ladies whom I have mentioned, and when their plans were made known to me, Mr. Garrison not only had the route mapped out, but had, I believe, selected the steamer upon which we were to sail. The whole thing was so sudden and so unexpected that I was completely taken off my feet. I had been at work steadily for eighteen years in connection with Tuskegee, and I had never thought of anything else but ending my life in that way. Each day the school seemed to depend upon me more largely for its daily expenses, and I told these Boston friends that, while I thanked them sincerely for their thoughtfulness and generosity, I could not go to Europe, for the reason that the school would not live financially while I was absent. They then informed me that Mr. Henry L. Higginson and some other good friends who I know do not want their names made public were then raising a sum of money which would be sufficient to keep the school in operation while I was away. At this point I was compelled to surrender. Every avenue of escape had been closed. Deep down in my heart the whole thing seemed more like a dream than like reality, and for a long time it was difficult for me to make myself believe that I was actually going to Europe. I had been born and largely reared in the lowest depths of slavery, ignorance and poverty. In my childhood I had suffered for want of a place to sleep, for lack of food, clothing and shelter. I had not had the privilege of sitting down to a dining-table until I was quite well grown. Luxuries had always seemed to me to be something meant for white people, not for my race. I had always regarded Europe and London and Paris much as I regarded heaven. And now could it be that I was actually going to Europe? Such thoughts as these were constantly with me. Two other thoughts troubled me a good deal. I feared that people who heard that Mrs. Washington and I were going to Europe might not know all the circumstances, and might get the idea that we had become, as some might say, stuck up, and were trying to show off. I recalled that from my youth I had heard it said that too often when people of my race reached any degree of success they were inclined to unduly exalt themselves, to try and ape the wealthy, and in so doing to lose their heads. The fear that people might think this of us haunted me a good deal. Then, too, I could not see how my conscience would permit me to spare the time from my work and be happy. It seemed mean and selfish in me to be taking a vacation while others were at work, and while there was so much that needed to be done. From the time I could remember I had always been at work, and I did not see how I could spend three or four months in doing nothing. The fact was that I did not know how to take a vacation. 
Mrs. Washington had much the same difficulty in getting away, but she was anxious to go because she thought that I needed the rest. There were many important national questions bearing upon the life of the race which were being agitated at that time, and this made it all the harder for us to decide to go. We finally gave our Boston friends our promise that we would go, and then insisted that the date of our departure be set as soon as possible. So we decided upon May 10. My good friend Mr. Garrison kindly took charge of all the details necessary for the success of the trip, and he, as well as other friends, gave us a great number of letters of introduction to people in France and England, and made other arrangements for our comfort and convenience abroad. Goodbyes were said at Tuskegee, and we were in New York May 9, ready to sail the next day. Our daughter Portia, who was then studying in South Framingham, Massachusetts, came to New York to see us off. Mr. Scott, my secretary, came with me to New York in order that I might clear up the last bit of business before I left. Other friends also came to New York to see us off. Just before we went on board the steamer, another pleasant surprise came to us in the form of a letter from two generous ladies, stating that they had decided to give us the money with which to erect a new building to be used in properly housing all our industries for girls at Tuskegee. We were to sail on the Friesland of the Red Star Line, and a beautiful vessel she was. We went on board just before noon, the hour of sailing. I had never before been on board a large ocean steamer, and the feeling which took possession of me when I found myself there is rather hard to describe. It was a feeling, I think, of awe mingled with delight. We were agreeably surprised to find that the captain, as well as several of the other officers, not only knew who we were, but was expecting us and gave us a pleasant greeting. There were several passengers whom we knew, including Senator Sewell of New Jersey, and Edward Marshall, the newspaper correspondent. I had just a little fear that we would not be treated civilly by some of the passengers. This fear was based upon what I had heard other people of my race, who had crossed the ocean, say about unpleasant experiences in crossing the ocean in American vessels. But in our case, from the captain down to the most humble servant, we were treated with the greatest kindness. Nor was this kindness confined to those who were connected with the steamer. It was shown by all the passengers also. There were not a few southern men and women on board, and they were as cordial as those from other parts of the country. As soon as the last goodbyes were said, and the steamer had cut loose from the wharf, the load of care, anxiety, and responsibility which I had carried for eighteen years began to lift itself from my shoulders at the rate, it seemed to me, of a pound a minute. It was the first time in all those years that I had felt, even in a measure, free from care, and my feeling of relief it is hard to describe on paper. Added to this was the delightful anticipation of being in Europe soon. It all seemed more like a dream than like a reality. Mr. Garrison had thoughtfully arranged to have us have one of the most comfortable rooms on the ship. The second or third day out I began to sleep, and I think that I slept at the rate of fifteen hours a day during the remainder of the ten days' passage. Then it was that I began to understand how tired I really was. These long sleeps I kept up for a month after we landed on the other side. It was such an unusual feeling to wake up in the morning and realize that I had no engagements did not have to take a train at a certain hour, did not have an appointment to meet someone or to make an address at a certain hour. How different all this was from the experiences that I have been through when travelling, when I have sometimes slept in three different beds in a single night. When Sunday came, the captain invited me to conduct the religious services, but, not being a minister, I declined. The passengers, however, began making requests that I deliver an address to them in the dining saloon some time during the voyage, and this I consented to do. Senator Sewell presided at this meeting. After ten days of delightful weather, during which I was not seasick for a day, we landed at the interesting old city of Antwerp in Belgium. The next day after we landed happened to be one of those numberless holidays which the people of those countries are in the habit of observing. It was a bright, beautiful day. Our room in the hotel faced the main public square, and the sights there, the people coming in from the country with all kinds of beautiful flowers to sell, 
the women coming in with their dogs drawing large, brightly polished cans filled with milk, the people streaming into the cathedral, filled me with a sense of newness that I had never before experienced. After spending some time in Antwerp, we were invited to go with a party of a half-dozen persons on a trip through Holland. This party included Edward Marshall and some American artists who had come over on the same steamer with us. We accepted the invitation and enjoyed the trip greatly. It was all the more interesting and instructive because we went for the most of the way on one of the slow, old-fashioned canal boats. This gave us an opportunity of seeing and studying the real life of the people in the country districts. We went in this way as far as Rotterdam, and later went to The Hague, where the peace conference was then in session, and where we were kindly received by the American representatives. The thing that impressed itself most on me in Holland was the thoroughness of the agriculture and the excellence of the Holstein cattle. I never knew, before visiting Holland, how much it was possible for people to get out of a small plot of ground. It seemed to me that absolutely no land was wasted. It was worth a trip to Holland, too, just to get a sight of three or four hundred fine Holstein cows grazing in one of those intensely green fields. From Holland we went to Belgium, and made a hasty trip through that country, stopping at Brussels, where we visited the battlefield of Waterloo. From Belgium we went direct to Paris, where we found that Mr. Theodore Stanton, the son of Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, had kindly provided accommodations for us. We had barely got settled in Paris before an invitation came to me from the University Club of Paris to be its guest at a banquet which was soon to be given. The other guests were ex-President Benjamin Harrison and Archbishop Ireland, who were in Paris at the time. The American ambassador, General Horace Porter, presided at the banquet. My address on this occasion seemed to give satisfaction to those who heard it. General Harrison kindly devoted a large portion of his remarks at dinner to myself and to the influence of the work at Tuskegee on the American race question. After my address at this banquet, other invitations came to me, but I declined the most of them, knowing that if I accepted them all, the object of my visit would be defeated. I did, however, consent to deliver an address in the American chapel the following Sunday morning, and at this meeting, General Harrison, General Porter, and other distinguished Americans were present. Later we received a formal call from the American ambassador, and were invited to attend a reception at his residence. At this reception we met many Americans, among them Justices Fuller and Harlan of the United States Supreme Court. During our entire stay of a month in Paris, both the American ambassador and his wife, as well as several other Americans, were very kind to us. While in Paris, we saw a good deal of the now famous American Negro painter, Mr. Henry O. Tanner, whom we had formerly known in America. It was very satisfactory to find how well known Mr. Tanner was in the field of art, and to note the high standing which all classes accorded to him. When we told some Americans that we were going to the Luxembourg Palace to see a painting by an American Negro, it was hard to convince them that a Negro had been thus honored. I do not believe that they were really convinced of the fact until they saw the picture for themselves. My acquaintance with Mr. Tanner reinforced in my mind the truth which I am constantly trying to impress upon our students at Tuskegee, and on our people throughout the country, as far as I can reach them with my voice, that any man, regardless of color, will be recognized and rewarded just in proportion as he learns to do something well, learns to do it better than someone else however humble the thing may be. As I have said, I believe that my race will succeed in proportion as it learns to do a common thing in an uncommon manner, learns to do a thing so thoroughly that no one can improve upon what it has done, learns to make its services of indispensable value. This was the spirit that inspired me in my first effort at Hampton, when I was given the opportunity to sweep and dust that schoolroom. In a degree, I felt that my whole future life depended upon the thoroughness with which I cleaned that room, and I was determined to do it so well that no one could find any fault with the job. Few people ever stopped, I found, when looking at his pictures, to inquire whether Mr. Tanner was a Negro painter, a French painter, or a German painter. They simply knew that he was able to produce something which the world wanted, a great painting 
and the matter of his color did not enter into their minds. When a negro girl learns to cook, to wash dishes, to sew, or to write a book, or a negro boy learns to groom horses, or to grow sweet potatoes, or to produce butter, or to build a house, or to be able to practice medicine as well or better than someone else, they will be rewarded regardless of race or color. In the long run, the world is going to have the best, and any difference in race, religion, or previous history will not long keep the world from what it wants. I think that the whole future of my race hinges on the question as to whether or not it can make itself of such indispensable value that the people in the town and the state where we reside will feel that our presence is necessary to the happiness and well-being of the community. No man who continues to add something to the material, intellectual, and moral well-being of the place in which he lives is long left without proper reward. This is a great human law which cannot be permanently nullified. The love of pleasure and excitement, which seems in a large measure to possess the French people, impressed itself upon me. I think they are more noted in this respect than is true of the people of my own race. In point of morality and moral earnestness, I do not believe that the French are ahead of my own race in America. Severe competition and the great stress of life have led them to learn to do things more thoroughly and to exercise greater economy but time, I think, will bring my race to the same point. In the matter of truth and high honor, I do not believe that the average Frenchman is ahead of the American Negro, while so far as mercy and kindness to dumb animals go, I believe that my race is far ahead. In fact, when I left France I had more faith in the future of the black man in America than I had ever possessed. From Paris we went to London, and reached there early in July just about the height of the London social season. Parliament was in session, and there was a great deal of gaiety. Mr. Garrison and other friends had provided us with a large number of letters of introduction, and they had also sent letters to other persons in different parts of the United Kingdom, apprising these people of our coming. Very soon after reaching London we were flooded with invitations to attend all manner of social functions, and a great many invitations came to me asking that I deliver public addresses. The most of these invitations I declined, for the reason that I wanted to rest. Neither were we able to accept more than a small proportion of the other invitations. The Rev. Dr. Brooke Herford and Mrs. Herford, whom I had known in Boston, consulted with the American Ambassador, the Hon. Joseph Choate, and arranged for me to speak at a public meeting to be held in Essex Hall. Mr. Choate kindly consented to preside. The meeting was largely attended. There were many distinguished persons present, among them several members of Parliament, including Mr. James Bryce, who spoke at the meeting. What the American ambassador said in introducing me, as well as a synopsis of what I said, was widely published in England and in the American papers at the time. Dr. and Mrs. Herford gave Mrs. Washington and myself a reception, at which we had the privilege of meeting some of the best people in England. Throughout our stay in London, Ambassador Choate was most kind and attentive to us. At the Ambassador's reception I met for the first time Mark Twain. We were the guests several times of Mrs. T. Fisher Unwin, the daughter of the English statesman Richard Cobden. It seemed as if both Mr. and Mrs. Unwin could not do enough for our comfort and happiness. Later, for nearly a week, we were the guests of the daughter of John Bright, now Mrs. Clark, of Street, England. Both Mr. and Mrs. Clark, with their daughter, visited us at Tuskegee the next year. In Birmingham, England, we were the guests for several days of Mr. Joseph Sturge, whose father was a great abolitionist and friend of Whittier and Garrison. It was a great privilege to meet throughout England those who had known and honored the late William Lloyd Garrison, the Honorable Frederick Douglass, and other abolitionists. The English abolitionists with whom we came in contact never seemed to tire of talking about these two Americans. Before going to England I had had no proper conception of the deep interest displayed by the abolitionists of England in the cause of freedom, nor did I realize the amount of substantial help given by them. In Bristol, England, both Mrs. Washington and I spoke at the Women's Liberal Club. I was also the principal speaker at the commencement exercises of the Royal College for the Blind. These exercises were held in the Crystal Palace, 
and the presiding officer was the late Duke of Westminster, who was said to be, I believe, the richest man in England, if not in the world. The Duke, as well as his wife and their daughter, seemed to be pleased with what I said, and thanked me heartily. Through the kindness of Lady Aberdeen, my wife and I were enabled to go with a party of those who were attending the International Congress of Women, then in session in London, to see Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle, where afterward we were all the guests of Her Majesty at tea. In our party was Miss Susan B. Anthony, and I was deeply impressed with the fact that one did not often get an opportunity to see, during the same hour, two women so remarkable in different ways as Susan B. Anthony and Queen Victoria. In the House of Commons, which we visited several times, we met Sir Henry M. Stanley. I talked with him about Africa and its relation to the American Negro, and after my interview with him I became more convinced than ever that there was no hope of the American Negro's improving his condition by emigrating to Africa. On various occasions Mrs. Washington and I were the guests of Englishmen in their country homes, where, I think, one sees the Englishman at his best. In one thing, at least, I feel sure that the English are ahead of Americans, and that is that they have learned how to get more out of life. The home life of the English seems to me to be about as perfect as anything can be. Everything moves like clockwork. I was impressed, too, with the deference that the servants show to their masters and mistresses, terms which I suppose would not be tolerated in America. The English servant expects, as a rule, to be nothing but a servant, and so he perfects himself in the art to a degree that no class of servants in America has yet reached. In our country the servant expects to become in a few years a master himself. Which system is preferable? I will not venture an answer. Another thing that impressed itself upon me throughout England was the high regard that all classes have for law and order, and the ease and thoroughness with which everything is done. The Englishman, I found, took plenty of time for eating, as for everything else. I am not sure if, in the long run, they do not accomplish as much or more than rushing, nervous Americans do. My visit to England gave me a higher regard for the nobility than I had had. I had no idea that they were so generally loved and respected by the classes, nor had I any correct conception of how much time and money they spend in works of philanthropy, and how much real heart they put into this work. My impression had been that they merely spent money freely and had a good time. It was hard for me to get accustomed to speaking to English audiences. The average Englishman is so serious and is so tremendously in earnest about everything that when I told a story that would have made an American audience roar with laughter, the Englishman simply looked me straight in the face without even cracking a smile. When the Englishman takes you into his heart and friendship, he binds you there as with cords of steel, and I do not believe that there are many other friendships that are so lasting or so satisfactory. Perhaps I can illustrate this point in no better way than by relating the following incident. Mrs. Washington and I were invited to attend a reception given by the Duke and Duchess of Sutherland at Stafford House, said to be the finest house in London. I may add that I believe the Duchess of Sutherland is said to be the most beautiful woman in England. There must have been at least three hundred persons at this reception. Twice during the evening the Duchess sought us out for a conversation, and she asked me to write her when we got home, and tell her more about the work at Tuskegee. This I did. When Christmas came we were surprised and delighted to receive her photograph with her autograph on it. The correspondence has continued, and we now feel that in the Duchess of Sutherland we have one of our warmest friends. After three months in Europe we sailed from Southampton in the steamship St. Louis. On this steamer there was a fine library that had been presented to the ship by the citizens of St. Louis, Missouri. In this library I found a life of Frederick Douglass, which I began reading. I became especially interested in Mr. Douglass's description of the way he was treated on shipboard during his first or second visit to England. In this description he told how he was not permitted to enter the cabin, but had to confine himself to the deck of the ship. A few minutes after I had finished reading this description, I was waited on by a committee of ladies and gentlemen with the request that I deliver an address at a concert which was to begin the following evening. 
and yet there are people who are bold enough to say that race feeling in America is not growing less intense. At this concert, the Honorable Benjamin B. Odell, Jr., the present governor of New York, presided. I was never given a more cordial hearing anywhere. A large proportion of the passengers were Southern people. After the concert some of the passengers proposed that a subscription be raised to help the work at Tuskegee, and the money to support several scholarships was the result. While we were in Paris, I was very pleasantly surprised to receive the following invitation from the citizens of West Virginia and of the city near which I had spent my boyhood days. Charleston, West Virginia, May 16, 1899. Professor Booker T. Washington, Paris, France. Dear Sir, Many of the best citizens of West Virginia have united in liberal expressions of admiration and praise of your worth and work, and desire that on your return from Europe you should favor them with your presence and with the inspiration of your words. We must sincerely endorse this move, and on behalf of the citizens of Charleston extend to you our most cordial invitation to have you come to us, that we may honor you who have done so much by your life and work to honor us. We are, very truly yours, the Common Council of the City of Charleston, by W. Herman Smith, Mayor. This invitation from the City Council of Charleston was accompanied by the following. Professor Booker T. Washington, Paris, France. Dear Sir, we, the citizens of Charleston and West Virginia, desire to express our pride in you and the splendid career that you have thus far accomplished and ask that we be permitted to show our pride and interest in a substantial way. Your recent visit to your old home in our midst awoke within us the keenest regret that we were not permitted to hear you and render some substantial aid to your work before you left for Europe. In view of the foregoing, we earnestly invite you to share the hospitality of our city upon your return from Europe and give us the opportunity to hear you and put ourselves in touch with your work in a way that will be most gratifying to yourself, and that we may receive the inspiration of your words and presence. An early reply to this invitation, with an indication of the time you may reach our city, will greatly oblige. Yours very respectfully, the Charleston Daily Gazette, the Daily Mail Tribune, G. W. Atkinson, Governor, E. L. Boggs, Secretary to the Governor. William M. O. Dawson, Secretary of State, L. M. La Follette, Auditor, J. R. Trotter, Superintendent of Schools, E. W. Wilson, Ex-Governor, W. A. McCorkle, Ex-Governor, John Q. Dickinson, President, Kanawha Valley Bank, L. Pritchard, President, Charleston National Bank, George S. Couch, President, Kanawha National Bank, Ed Reed, Cashier, Kanawha National Bank, George S. Laidley, Superintendent City Schools, L. E. McWhorter, President, Board of Education, Charles K. Payne, Wholesale Merchant, and many others. This invitation, coming as it did from the City Council, the State Officers, and all the substantial citizens of both races of the community where I had spent my boyhood, and from which I had gone a few years before, unknown in poverty and ignorance, in quest of an education, not only surprised me, but almost unmanned me. I could not understand what I had done to deserve it all. I accepted the invitation, and at the appointed day was met at the railway station at Charleston by a committee headed by ex-governor W. A. McCorkle, and composed of men of both races. The public reception was held in the Opera House at Charleston. The governor of the state, the Honorable George W. Atkinson, presided and an address of welcome was made by ex-Governor McCorkle. A prominent part in the reception was taken by the colored citizens. The Opera House was filled with citizens of both races, and among the white people were many for whom I had worked when I was a boy. The next day Governor and Mrs. Atkinson gave me a public reception at the State House, which was attended by all classes. Not long after this, the colored people in Atlanta, Georgia, gave me a reception at which the governor of the state presided, and a similar reception was given me in New Orleans, which was presided over by the mayor of the city. Invitations came from many other places which I was not able to accept. End of chapter 16
Chapter 17 From Up From Slavery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Up From Slavery. Chapter 17 Last Words. Before going to Europe, some events came into my life which were great surprises to me. In fact, my whole life has largely been one of surprises. I believe that any man's life will be filled with constant, unexpected encouragements of this kind if he makes up his mind to do his level best each day of his life, that is, tries to make each day reach as nearly as possible the high water mark of pure, unselfish, useful living. I pity the man, black or white, who has never experienced the joy and satisfaction that come to one by reason of an effort to assist in making someone else more useful and more happy. Six months before he died, and nearly a year after he had been stricken with paralysis, General Armstrong expressed a wish to visit Tuskegee again before he passed away. Notwithstanding the fact that he had lost the use of his limbs to such an extent that he was practically helpless, his wish was gratified, and he was brought to Tuskegee. The owners of the Tuskegee Railroad, white men living in the town, offered to run a special train, without cost, out of the main station, Chihaw, five miles away, to meet him. He arrived on the school grounds about nine o'clock in the evening. Someone had suggested that we give the general a pine-knot torchlight reception. This plan was carried out, and the moment that his carriage entered the school grounds he began passing between two lines of lighted and waving fat pine wood-knots held over by a thousand students and teachers. The whole thing was so novel and surprising that the general was completely overcome with happiness. He remained a guest in my home for nearly two months, and, although almost wholly without the use of voice or limb, he spent nearly every hour in devising ways and means to help the South. Time and time again he said to me during this visit that it was not only the duty of the country to assist in elevating the Negro of the South, but the poor white man as well. At the end of his visit, I resolved anew to devote myself more earnestly than ever to the cause which was so near his heart. I said that if a man in his condition was willing to think, work, and act, I should not be wanting in furthering in every possible way the wish of his heart. The death of General Armstrong, a few weeks later, gave me the privilege of getting acquainted with one of the finest, most unselfish, and most attractive men that I have ever come in contact with. I refer to the Rev. Dr. Hollis B. Frissell, now the principal of the Hampton Institute, and General Armstrong's successor. Under the clear, strong, and almost perfect leadership of Dr. Frissell, Hampton has had a career of prosperity and usefulness that is all that the General could have wished for. It seems to be the constant effort of Dr. Frissell to hide his own great personality behind that of General Armstrong to make himself of no reputation for the sake of the cause. More than once I have been asked what was the greatest surprise that ever came to me. I have a little hesitation in answering that question. It was the following letter, which came to me one Sunday morning when I was sitting on the veranda of my home at Tuskegee, surrounded by my wife and three children. Harvard University, Cambridge, May 28, 1896 President Booker T. Washington. My dear sir, Harvard University desired to confer on you at the approaching commencement an honorary degree, but it is our custom to confer degrees only on gentlemen who are present. Our commencement occurs this year on June 24, and your presence would be desirable from about noon till about five o'clock in the afternoon. Would it be possible for you to be in Cambridge on that day? Believe me, with great regard, very truly yours, Charles W. Eliot. This was a recognition that had never in the slightest manner entered into my mind, and it was hard for me to realize that I was to be honored by a degree from the oldest and most renowned university in America. As I sat upon my veranda with this letter in my hand, tears came into my eyes. My whole former life, my life as a slave on the plantation, my work in the coal mine, the times when I was without food and clothing, when I made my bed under a sidewalk, my struggles for an education, the trying days I had had at Tuskegee, days when I did not know where to turn for a dollar to continue the work there, the ostracism and sometimes oppression of my race, 
all this passed before me and nearly overcame me. I had never sought or cared for what the world calls fame. I have always looked upon fame as something to be used in accomplishing good. I have often said to my friends that if I can use whatever prominence may have come to me as an instrument with which to do good, I am content to have it. I care for it only as a means to be used for doing good, just as wealth may be used. The more I come into contact with wealthy people, the more I believe that they are growing in the direction of looking upon their money simply as an instrument which God has placed in their hand for doing good with. I never go to the office of Mr. John D. Rockefeller, who more than once has been generous to Tuskegee, without being reminded of this. The close, careful, and minute investigation that he always makes in order to be sure that every dollar that he gives will do the most good, an investigation that is just as searching as if he were investing money in a business enterprise, convinces me that the growth in this direction is most encouraging. At nine o'clock on the morning of June 24, I met President Elliot, the Board of Overseers at Harvard University, and the other guests, at the designated place on the university grounds, for the purpose of being escorted to Sanders Theatre, where the commencement exercises were to be held and degrees conferred. Among others invited to be present for the purpose of receiving a degree at this time were General Nelson A. Miles, Dr. Bell, the inventor of the Bell Telephone, Bishop Vincent, and the Rev. Minot J. Savage. We were placed in line immediately behind the President and the Board of Overseers, and directly afterward the Governor of Massachusetts, escorted by the Lancers, arrived and took his place in the line of march by the side of President Elliot. In the line there were also various other officers and professors, clad in cap and gown. In this order we marched to Sanders Theatre, where, after the usual commencement exercises, came the conferring of the honorary degrees. This, it seems, is always considered the most interesting feature at Harvard. It is not known, until the individuals appear, upon whom the honorary degrees are to be conferred, and those receiving these honors are cheered by the students and others in proportion to their popularity. During the conferring of the degrees excitement and enthusiasm are at the highest pitch. When my name was called, I rose, and President Elliot, in beautiful and strong English, conferred upon me the degree of Master of Arts. After these exercises were over, those who had received honorary degrees were invited to lunch with the President. After the lunch we were formed in line again, and were escorted by the Marshal of the day, who that year happened to be Bishop William Lawrence, through the grounds where at different points those who had been honored were called by name and received the Harvard yell. This march ended at Memorial Hall, where the alumni dinner was served. To see over a thousand strong men, representing all that is best in state, church, business, and education, with the glow and enthusiasm of college loyalty and college pride, which has, I think, a peculiar Harvard flavor, is a sight that does not easily fade from memory. Among the speakers after dinner were President Elliot, Governor Roger Wolcott, General Miles, Dr. Minot J. Savage, the Honorable Henry Cabot Lodge, and myself. When I was called upon, I said, among other things, It would in some measure relieve my embarrassment if I could, even in a slight degree, feel myself worthy of the great honor which you do me today. Why you have called me from the black belt of the South, from among my humble people, to share in the honors of this occasion, is not for me to explain and yet it may not be inappropriate for me to suggest that it seems to me that one of the most vital questions that touch our American life is how to bring the strong, wealthy, and learned into helpful touch with the poorest, most ignorant, and humblest, and at the same time make one appreciate the vitalizing, strengthening influence of the other. How shall we make the mansion on yon Beacon Street feel and see the need of the spirits in the lowliest cabin in Alabama cotton fields, or Louisiana sugar bottoms. This problem Harvard University is solving, not by bringing itself down, but by bringing the masses up. If my life in the past has meant anything in the lifting up of my people and the bringing about of better relations between your race and mine, I assure you from this day it will mean doubly more. 
in the economy of God, there is but one standard by which an individual can succeed. There is but one for a race. This country demands that every race shall measure itself by the American standard. By it a race must rise or fall, succeed or fail, and in the last analysis mere sentiment counts for little. During the next half-century and more, my race must continue passing through the severe American crucible. We are to be tested in our patience, our forbearance, our perseverance, our power to endure wrong, to withstand temptations, to economize, to acquire and use skill. In our ability to compete, to succeed in commerce, to disregard the superficial for the real, the appearance for the substance, to be great and yet small, learned and yet simple, high and yet the servant of all." As this was the first time that a New England university had conferred an honorary degree upon a negro, it was the occasion of much newspaper comment throughout the country. A correspondent of a New York paper said, When the name of Booker T. Washington was called, and he arose to acknowledge and accept, there was such an outburst of applause as greeted no other name except that of the popular soldier patriot, General Miles. The applause was not studied and stiff, sympathetic and condoling, it was enthusiasm and admiration. Every part of the audience from pit to gallery joined in, and a glow covered the cheeks of those around me, proving sincere appreciation of the rising struggle of an ex-slave and the work he has accomplished for his race. A Boston paper said editorially, in conferring the honorary degree of Master of Arts upon the principal of Tuskegee Institute, Harvard University has honored itself as well as the object of this distinction. The work which Professor Booker T. Washington has accomplished for the education, good citizenship, and popular enlightenment in his chosen field of labor in the South entitles him to rank with our national benefactors. The university which can claim him on its list of sons whether in regular course or honoris causa, may be proud. It has been mentioned that Mr. Washington is the first of his race to receive an honorary degree from a New England university. This in itself is a distinction. But the degree was not conferred because Mr. Washington is a colored man, or because he was born in slavery, but because he has shown, by his work for the elevation of the people of the Black Belt of the South, a genius and a broad humanity which count for greatness in any man, whether his skin be white or black. Another Boston paper said, It is Harvard which, first among New England colleges, confers an honorary degree upon a black man. No one who has followed the history of Tuskegee and its work can fail to admire the courage, persistence, and splendid common sense of Booker T. Washington. Well may Harvard honor the ex-slave, the value of whose services, alike to his race and country, only the future can estimate." The correspondent of the New York Times wrote, All the speeches were enthusiastically received, but the colored man carried off the oratorical honors, and the applause which broke out when he had finished was vociferous and long continued. Soon after I began work at Tuskegee, I formed a resolution, in the secret of my heart, that I would try to build up a school that would be of so much service to the country that the President of the United States would one day come to see it. This was, I confess, rather a bold resolution, and for a number of years I kept it hidden in my own thoughts, not daring to share it with anyone. In November 1897 I made the first move in this direction, and that was in securing a visit from a member of President McKinley's cabinet the Hon. James Wilson, Secretary of Agriculture. He came to deliver an address at the formal opening of the Slater Armstrong Agricultural Building, our first large building to be used for the purpose of giving training to our students in agriculture and kindred branches. In the fall of 1898 I heard that President McKinley was likely to visit Atlanta, Georgia, for the purpose of taking part in the Peace Jubilee exercises to be held there to commemorate the successful close of the Spanish-American War. At this time I had been hard at work, together with our teachers, for eighteen years, trying to build up a school that we thought would be of service to the nation. And I determined to make a direct effort to secure a visit from the President and his Cabinet. 
I went to Washington, and I was not long in the city before I found my way to the White House. When I got there I found the waiting-rooms full of people, and my heart began to sink, for I feared there would not be much chance of my seeing the President that day, if at all. But at any rate I got an opportunity to see Mr. J. Addison Porter, the secretary to the President, and explain to him my mission. Mr. Porter kindly sent my card directly to the President, and in a few minutes word came from Mr. McKinley that he would see me. How any man could see so many people of all kinds, with all kinds of errands, and do so much hard work and still keep himself calm, patient and fresh for each visitor, in the way that President McKinley does, I cannot understand. When I saw the President he kindly thanked me for the work which we were doing at Tuskegee for the interests of the country. I then told him, briefly, the object of my visit. I impressed upon him the fact that a visit from the chief executive of the nation would not only encourage our students and teachers, but would help the entire race. He seemed interested, but did not make a promise to go to Tuskegee, for the reason that his plans about going to Atlanta were not then fully made, but he asked me to call the matter to his attention a few weeks later. By the middle of the following month the President had definitely decided to attend the Peace Jubilee at Atlanta. I went to Washington again and saw him, with a view of getting him to extend his trip to Tuskegee. On this second visit Mr. Charles W. Hare, a prominent white citizen of Tuskegee, kindly volunteered to accompany me, to reinforce my invitation with one from the white people of Tuskegee and the vicinity. Just previous to my going to Washington the second time, the country had been excited and the colored people greatly depressed because of several severe race riots which had occurred at different points in the South. As soon as I saw the President, I perceived that his heart was greatly burdened by reason of these race disturbances. Although there were many people waiting to see him, he detained me for some time, discussing the condition and prospects of the race. He remarked several times that he was determined to show his interest and faith in the race, not merely in words, but by acts. When I told him that I thought that at that time scarcely anything would go farther in giving hope and encouragement to the race than the fact that the President of the nation would be willing to travel one hundred and forty miles out of his way to spend a day at a Negro institution, he seemed deeply impressed. While I was with the President, a white citizen of Atlanta, a Democrat and an ex-slaveholder, came into the room, and the President asked his opinion as to the wisdom of his going to Tuskegee. Without hesitation the Atlanta man replied that it was the proper thing for him to do. This opinion was reinforced by that friend of the race, Dr. J. L. M. Curry. The President promised that he would visit our school on the 16th of December. When it became known that the President was going to visit our school, the white citizens of the town of Tuskegee, a mile distant from the school, were as much pleased as were our students and teachers. The white people of this town, including both men and women, began arranging to decorate the town and to form themselves into committees for the purpose of cooperating with the officers of our school in order that the distinguished visitor might have a fitting reception. I think I never realized before this how much the white people of Tuskegee and vicinity thought of our institution. During the days when we were preparing for the President's reception, dozens of these people came to me and said that, while they did not want to push themselves into prominence, if there was anything they could do to help or to relieve me personally, I had but to intimate it and they would be only too glad to assist. In fact, the thing that touched me almost as deeply as the visit of the President himself was the deep pride which all classes of citizens in Alabama seemed to take in our work. The morning of December 16th brought to the little city of Tuskegee such a crowd as it had never seen before. With the President came Mrs. McKinley and all of the Cabinet officers but one, and most of them brought their wives or some members of their families. Several prominent generals came, including General Shafter and General Joseph Wheeler, who were recently returned from the Spanish-American War. There was also a host of newspaper correspondents. The Alabama legislature was in session in Montgomery at this time. This body passed a resolution to adjourn for the purpose of visiting Tuskegee. 
just before the arrival of the President's party, the legislature arrived, headed by the governor and other state officials. The citizens of Tuskegee had decorated the town from the station to the school in a generous manner. In order to economize in the matter of time, we arranged to have the whole school pass in review before the President. Each student carried a stalk of sugar-cane with some open bowls of cotton fastened to the end of it. Following the students, the work of all departments of the school passed in review, displayed on floats drawn by horses, mules, and oxen. On these floats we tried to exhibit not only the present work of the school, but to show the contrasts between the old methods of doing things and the new. As an example, we showed the old method of dairying in contrast with the improved methods, the old methods of tilling the soil in contrast with the new, the old methods of cooking and housekeeping in contrast with the new. These floats consumed an hour and a half of time in passing. In his address in our large new chapel, which the students had recently completed, the President said, among other things, "'To meet you under such pleasant auspices, and to have the opportunity of a personal observation of your work, is indeed most gratifying. The Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute is ideal in its conception, and has already a large and growing reputation in the country, and is not unknown abroad. I congratulate all who are associated in this undertaking for the good work which it is doing in the education of its students to lead lives of honor and usefulness, thus exalting the race for which it was established. Nowhere, I think, could a more delightful location have been chosen for this unique educational experiment, which has attracted the attention and won the support even of conservative philanthropists in all sections of the country. To speak of Tuskegee without paying special tribute to Booker T. Washington's genius and perseverance would be impossible. The inception of this noble enterprise was his, and he deserves high credit for it. His was the enthusiasm and enterprise which made its steady progress possible and established in the institution its present high standard of accomplishment. He has won a worthy reputation as one of the great leaders of his race widely known and much respected at home and abroad, as an accomplished educator, a great orator, and a true philanthropist. The Hon. John D. Long, the Secretary of the Navy, said in part, I cannot make a speech today. My heart is too full, full of hope, admiration, and pride for my countrymen of both sections and both colors. I am filled with gratitude and admiration for your work and from this time forward I shall have absolute confidence in your progress and in the solution of the problem in which you are engaged. The problem, I say, has been solved. A picture has been presented today which should be put upon canvas with the pictures of Washington and Lincoln and transmitted to future time and generations, a picture which the press of the country should spread broadcast over the land, a most dramatic picture and that picture is this, the President of the United States standing on this platform. On one side, the Governor of Alabama, on the other, completing the Trinity, a representative of a race only a few years ago in bondage, the colored President of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute. God bless the President under whose majesty such a scene as this is presented to the American people. God bless the State of Alabama which is showing that it can deal with this problem for itself. God bless the orator, philanthropist, and disciple of the great master, who, if he were on earth, would be doing the same work. Booker T. Washington Postmaster General Smith closed the address which he made with these words. We have witnessed many spectacles within the last few days. We have seen the magnificent grandeur and the magnificent achievements of one of the great metropolitan cities of the South. We have seen heroes of the war pass by in procession. We have seen floral parades. But I am sure my colleagues will agree with me in saying that we have witnessed no spectacle more impressive and more encouraging, more inspiring for our future, than that which we have witnessed here this morning. Some days after the President returned to Washington, I received the letter which follows. 
Executive Mansion, Washington, December 23, 1899. Dear Sir, By this mail I take pleasure in sending you embossed copies of the souvenir of the visit of the President to your institution. These sheets bear the autographs of the President and the members of the Cabinet who accompanied him on the trip. Let me take this opportunity of congratulating you most heartily and sincerely upon the great success of the exercises provided for and entertainment furnished us under your auspices during our visit to Tuskegee. Every feature of the program was perfectly executed and was viewed or participated in with the heartiest satisfaction by every visitor present. The unique exhibition which you gave of your pupils engaged in their industrial vocations was not only artistic but thoroughly impressive. The tribute paid by the President and his Cabinet to your work was none too high and forms a most encouraging augury, I think, for the future prosperity of your institution. I cannot close without assuring you that the modesty shown by yourself in the exercises was most favorably commented upon by all the members of our party. With best wishes for the continued advance of your most useful and patriotic undertaking, kind personal regards, and the compliments of the season, believe me always. Very sincerely yours, John Addison Porter, Secretary to the President. To President Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, Tuskegee, Alabama. Twenty years have now passed since I made the first humble effort at Tuskegee, in a broken-down shanty and an old hen-house, without owning a dollar's worth of property, and with but one teacher and thirty students. At the present time the institution owns twenty-three hundred acres of land, one thousand of which are under cultivation each year, entirely by student labor. There are now upon the grounds, counting large and small, sixty-six buildings, and all except four of these have been almost wholly erected by the labor of our students. While the students are at work upon the land and in erecting buildings, they are taught, by competent instructors, the latest methods of agriculture and the trades connected with building. There are in constant operation at the school, in connection with thorough academic and religious training, thirty industrial departments. All of these teach industries at which our men and women can find immediate employment as soon as they leave the institution. The only difficulty now is that the demand for our graduates from both white and black people in the South is so great that we cannot supply more than one-half the persons for whom applications come to us. Neither have we the buildings nor the money for current expenses to enable us to admit to the school more than one-half the young men and women who apply to us for admission. In our industrial teaching we keep three things in mind. First, that the student shall be so educated that he shall be enabled to meet conditions as they exist now, in the part of the South where he lives. In a word, to be able to do the thing which the world wants done. Second, that every student who graduates from the school shall have enough skill, coupled with intelligence and moral character, to enable him to make a living for himself and others. Third, to send every graduate out feeling and knowing that labor is dignified and beautiful, to make each one love labor instead of trying to escape it. In addition to the agricultural training which we give to young men, and the training given to our girls in all the usual domestic employments, we now train a number of girls in agriculture each year. These girls are taught gardening, fruit-growing, dairying, bee-culture, and poultry-raising. While the institution is in no sense denominational, we have a department known as the Phelps Hall Bible Training School, in which a number of students are prepared for the ministry and other forms of Christian work, especially work in the country districts. What is equally important, each one of the students works half of each day at some industry, in order to get skill and the love of work, so that when he goes out from the institution he is prepared to set the people with whom he goes to labor a proper example in the matter of industry. The value of our property is now over seven hundred thousand dollars. If we add to this our endowment fund, which at present is one million dollars, the value of the total property is now one million seven hundred thousand dollars. Aside from the need for more buildings and for money for current expenses, the endowment fund should be increased to at least three million dollars. The annual current expenses are now about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. 
The greater part of this I collect each year by going from door to door and from house to house. All of our property is free from mortgage, and is deeded to an undenominational board of trustees who have the control of the institution. From thirty students the number has grown to fourteen hundred, coming from twenty-seven states and territories, from Africa, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and other foreign countries. In our departments there are one hundred and ten officers and instructors, and if we add the families of our instructors we have a constant population upon our grounds of not far from seventeen hundred people. I have often been asked how we keep so large a body of people together, and at the same time keep them out of mischief. There are two answers, that the men and women who come to us for an education are in earnest, and that everybody is kept busy. The following outline of our daily work will testify to this. 5 a.m. Rising bell. 5.50 a.m. Warning breakfast bell. 6 a.m. Breakfast bell. 6.20 a.m. Breakfast over. 6.20 to 6.50 a.m. Rooms are cleaned. 6.50 Work bell. 7.30 Morning study hours. 8.20 Morning school bell. 8.25 Inspection of young men's toilet in ranks. 8.40, devotional exercises in chapel. 8.55, five minutes with the daily news. 9 a.m., classwork begins. 12, classwork closes. 12.15 p.m., dinner. 1 p.m., work bell. 1.30 p.m., classwork begins. 3.30 p.m., classwork ends. 5.30 p.m., bell to knock off work. 6 p.m., supper. 7.10 p.m. Evening prayers. 7.30 p.m. Evening study hours. 8.45 p.m. Evening study hour closes. 9.20 p.m. Morning retiring bell. 9.30 p.m. Retiring bell. We try to keep constantly in mind the fact that the worth of the school is to be judged by its graduates. Counting those who have finished the full course together with those who have taken enough training to enable them to do reasonably good work, we can safely say that at least six thousand men and women from Tuskegee are now at work in different parts of the South. Men and women, who, by their own example or by direct efforts, are showing the masses of our race now to improve their material, educational, and moral and religious life. What is equally important, they are exhibiting a degree of common sense and self-control, which is causing better relations to exist between the races, and is causing the southern white man to learn to believe in the value of educating the men and women of my race. Aside from this, there is the influence that is constantly being exerted through the mother's meeting and the plantation work conducted by Mrs. Washington. Wherever our graduates go, the changes which soon begin to appear in the buying of land, improving homes, saving money, in education, and in high moral characters are remarkable. Whole communities are fast being revolutionized through the instrumentality of these men and women. Ten years ago I organized at Tuskegee the first Negro Conference. This is an annual gathering which now brings to the school eight or nine hundred representative men and women of the race, who come to spend a day in finding out what the actual industrial, mental, and moral conditions of the people are, and in forming plans for improvement. Out from this central Negro conference at Tuskegee have grown numerous state and local conferences which are doing the same kind of work. As a result of the influence of these gatherings, one delegate reported at the last annual meeting that ten families in his community had bought and paid for homes. On the day following the annual Negro conference there is the Workers' Conference. This is composed of officers and teachers who are engaged in educational work in the larger institutions in the South. The Negro Conference furnishes a rare opportunity for these workers to study the real condition of the rank and file of the people. In the summer of 1900, with the assistance of such prominent colored men as Mr. T. Thomas Fortune, who has always upheld my hands in every effort, I organized the National Negro Business League, which held its first meeting in Boston, and brought together for the first time a large number of the colored men who are engaged in various lines of trade or business in different parts of the United States. Thirty states were represented at our first meeting. Out of this national meeting grew state and local business leagues. In addition to looking after the executive side of the work at Tuskegee, 
and raising the greater part of the money for the support of the school, I cannot seem to escape the duty of answering at least a part of the calls which come to me unsought to address southern white audiences and audiences of my own race, as well as frequent gatherings in the North. As to how much of my time is spent in this way, the following clipping from a Buffalo, New York paper will tell. This has reference to an occasion when I spoke before the National Educational Association in that city. Booker T. Washington, the foremost educator among the colored people of the world, was a very busy man from the time he arrived in the city the other night from the West and registered at the Iroquois. He had hardly removed the stains of travel when it was time to partake of supper. Then he held a public levy in the parlors of the Iroquois until eight o'clock. During that time he was greeted by over two hundred eminent teachers and educators from all parts of the United States. Shortly after eight o'clock he was driven in a carriage to Music Hall, and in one hour and a half he made two ringing addresses, to as many as five thousand people, on Negro education. Then Mr. Washington was taken in charge by a delegation of colored citizens, headed by the Reverend Mr. Watkins, and hustled off to a small informal reception, arranged in honor of the visitor by the people of his race. Nor can I, in addition to making these addresses, escape the duty of calling the attention of the South and of the country in general, through the medium of the press, to matters that pertain to the interests of both races. This, for example, I have done in regard to the evil habit of lynching. When the Louisiana State Constitutional Convention was in session, I wrote an open letter to that body pleading for justice for the race. In all such efforts I have received warm and hearty support from the Southern newspapers, as well as from those in all other parts of the country. Despite superficial and temporary signs which might lead one to entertain a contrary opinion, there was never a time when I felt more hopeful for the race than I do at the present. The great human law that in the end recognizes and rewards merit is everlasting and universal. The outside world does not know, neither can it appreciate, the struggle that is constantly going on in the hearts of both the southern white people and their former slaves to free themselves from racial prejudice. And while both races are thus struggling they should have the sympathy, the support, and the forbearance of the rest of the world. As I write the closing words of this autobiography I find myself, not by design, in the city of Richmond, Virginia, the city which only a few decades ago was the capital of the Southern Confederacy and where, about twenty-five years ago, because of my poverty, I slept night after night under a sidewalk. This time I am in Richmond as the guest of the colored people of the city, and came at their request to deliver an address last night to both races in the Academy of Music, the largest and finest audience room in the city. This was the first time that the colored people had ever been permitted to use this hall. The day before I came, the city council passed a vote to attend the meeting in a body to hear me speak. The state legislature, including the House of Delegates and the Senate, also passed a unanimous vote to attend in a body. In the presence of hundreds of colored people, many distinguished white citizens, the city council, the state legislature, and state officials, I delivered my message, which was one of hope and cheer, and from the bottom of my heart I thanked both races for this welcome back to the state that gave me birth. The End of Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington